Oh, hey, what's going on, guys? Uh, this is weird, right? Uh, welcome to the Drunk George Show. And uh, I don't know if you can tell, I'm not Pat or Josh. Uh, I'm local Dungeon Master Justin. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to do something different. Uh, I have a very deep love of Eastern arts and uh, martial arts in particular. And I have one person in my life who is a massive uh, martial arts nut. And that happens to be my dad. So I decided to interview him. He's doing some things and he's been doing this as long as I've been alive. I'm 30. He's 52. Uh, so he's been doing it quite for quite some time. Um, we tried doing it uh, in a prior take. And unfortunately, the uh, internet on my end cut out and didn't save <laughs> so luckily the second round uh which you're about to see is a lot longer and there are times where either myself or him will uh cut out but nothing to the extent of <laughs> previously uh noted and it's far and in between so if you are ready to go on this journey with me uh, go ahead and uh, enjoy, and I will see you guys later, because I need to go to bed now. No, you just glitched up. I know I glitched. I know. Uh, okay, uh, welcome to episode, I don't even know, of the Junk Door Show. It's different. Uh, Pat and Josh are not here, but I'm here. And I'm with a very uh, interesting guest that I've wanted to interview for a while. Uh, I have Tony Velez, and my name is Justin Velez. And you can kind of like, if you're watching, you can see how close we are in age. He's my older brother. Really, really cool. Um, nothing, nothing. Uh, he's, would you, this is my father, my very lovely father. Um, and I wanted to essentially reach out to him because, uh, we both have a mutual, uh, love of Eastern culture and martial arts, him a little bit more than me, uh, but that's okay. And I really just kind of wanted to pick his brain. Um, this is kind of take two of what we're doing because, uh, we had some great stuff, but, uh, internet decided not to work in internet. So, uh, to kind of recap. Uh, we kind of went over where your point of origin was as far as what your interest in martial arts started. Uh, if you wanted to elaborate a little bit on that, Father. Yeah, so, right. So if I recall correctly. Yes. So, yes. Uh, the question was how, how I even got started. We didn't get mm -hmm. asked question. Uh, we did we're talking about the seventh grade. Grade. Yeah, I thought it was good content. Uh, and it's unfortunate, <laughs> but okay. It's yeah. okay. So, um, as I was saying earlier, you know, I, I, uh, I'm a child of the late 70s. Uh, Kung Fu was the craze. Uh, Bruce Lee was everywhere, you know. Uh, Bruce Lee died in uh, 74. I was born in 68. Uh, so, there's not a lot of years there. Uh, and, and it was everywhere. It was on TV. It was uh, uh, in movies. It was in magazines. Uh, it, it was a really cool time to be a kid, too. Yeah. Another big influence, especially in the 80s for me. So we came out of the Kung Fu craze and we went into uh, the ninja craze, at least in the theaters. Right. So Kasugi, uh, uh, I'm not even sure who the production houses are. You know, you had all the ninja movies, Pray for Death, and uh, uh, Ninja 3, The Exorcism, or whatever it was called. Uh, and then there was a television show called Master. Starring Lee Van Cleef right. of uh, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly Fame, um, and and so you know it was it was I guess predestiny. It, it was destined to be. Uh, to further complicate it, um, I have four older siblings. Uh, I have a, a cousin uh, who's contemporaneous with my brother's age and my sister's age. Who was a big Bruce Lee fan, Will Castro, and uh, of uh, Unique Whips fame, and I can remember he and my brother taking 
me and my cousin Bobby, Will's little brother, to the local Chinese movie theater. I grew up in the outskirts of Chinatown, the Lower East Side of Manhattan. That was a big influence. So all of this, uh, it was, you know, a foregone conclusion. I, I can I can absolutely recall, uh, you know, looking out the window early in the morning to watch old people out there practicing Yang Ta Chi, you know, and I, I didn't know what it was, you know, Yang style. Apparently there were five. Right. Um, but yeah, so that 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 exposure was always there. And then, you know, uh, my junior high school and high school years, Channel 5, Channel 5 in New York City was a big influence because they had a program lineup where every Saturday at 3 o'clock, you had a run one short kung fu flick, which, as anybody who knows me knows, I'm a run run short kung fu flick junkie. And yep. own just a, digitally just about every film, every kung fu, certainly the class. So I don't know that there was another option. And if that wasn't enough, the dean in my high school was a was a karate instructor, which is probably how I which is how I ended up with Dojo Real, right? So that really? gentleman's name is Arthur Boom, yeah. Archie okay. Ruland, he's my he's my karate father, uh, and he's also my uncle from marriage, which I didn't know at the time. I didn't find that out. I didn't realize that until many years later. And uh, it, it's really interesting. He's still alive and well. Uh, he uh, started his own school, his own style, uh, Ruland Go Juru out of Camden, New Jersey. Um, he was an educator. And he, he was good. He was a good man. Very influential, in my life. and I, I'm very thankful for that. That's so. That kind of answers my my next question was essentially because you and I, or or at least as long as I can remember, everything that we've watched or consumed has always been uh, kung fu movies, Chinese martial arts, whether it was Five Venoms or uh, right. Drunken Master, which I watched again today. By the way, really great good for you. Then I. I haven't seen Drunken Master, I want to say, in at least like 20 years. And the minute I saw Jackie Chan, I'm like, oh, that's Freddie Wong. <laughs> it was in there. It was just in there. I don't know yeah. why it was in there. Um, but so I was going to ask what kind of show, what led you to the path of doing Japanese karate as opposed right. to Chinese kung so, fu? So like I was saying, you know, uh, in my high school years, the dean of students was the karate instructor. And it's really funny because at the time it wasn't being offered in the school. I, I guess they had a karate club at some point, like a year or two, uh, mm -hmm. before before I realized it. So I guess this is going back uh, 84, 83, around there. Mm -hmm. And But I can remember seeing the trophies in the trophy case in the, uh, in the school lobby. And I'm like, hey, what's going on with this? And I have an interest in this. And and then track it down uh, to uh, to Archie Ruan, and um, and then I started pestering him. Mm -hmm. And so while he was not offering it out of the school, he had you know he was teaching uh, out of a school by the name of Yingi Kwan Wu Goju, which was uh, at the time they had just relocated from Roebling Street in Brooklyn to Broadway, uh, where the old uh, Bloomsburg Theater used to stand. Uh, that building has since come down, uh, which is a shame. Uh, you know, I, I I visited there a bunch of years ago and realized there was a big hole in the ground where my dojo used to be. And this was, you know, a very small dojo above a uh, an even smaller bakery, <laughs> and we would have and we would train for hours on end, sweating it out, on the, right under the L J train line, uh, with the smell of baking bread and donuts coming up. While your stomach is sucking on your spine because you know we were all poor then and everybody was broken you were always hungry all the time yeah but, uh, but that's you know how i ended up with the with the goju rule now to call the japanese karate is a little bit of a misnomer mm -hmm. right and now you get your history lesson lucky you uh, uh lucky you know, all of us karate as we know it comes from one place in the world and that's okinawa now the reason why I make the distinction is that is because Okinawa is, uh, all things considered, 
uh, a, a relatively new annexation to Japan. Okinawa was a territory of Japan for God knows how long, thousands of years, but it was not under, it was left alone to its own devices. And I think part of that reason was, was geopolitical. You know, Japan was an isolationist country for so many hundreds of years. And so according to their own policy, they couldn't do business with the outside world. So having uh, a chain of islands that were not probably closer to China than it is Japan, mm-hmm. see of J- uh, Japan, um, was uh, convenient for them to have an outlet, at least for trade, uh, once they became an isolationist country. At some point, they decided that uh, we're going to make them part of us. And so they became part of Japan. But I mean, we're talking about a people and a culture, uh, a world apart. Uh, they, it's a very distinct culture difference from from Japanese, uh, linguistically different, um, probably have more in common with China than with Japan. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that has to do with proximity, both China and Korea, the mainland. Uh, and probably have more in common with Polynesian Islanders than they do uh, the Japanese. Right. In a lot of respects, you know, and a lot of how they look at the world. And so, uh, and I like to make that distinction, right? So mm-hmm. when we're talking about Japanese karate, then we're talking about uh, specifically Shotokan karate. Right. right? Uh, so uh, we spoke about this before the, the internet glitched out. Uh, Gitcha Finkoshi, who brought karate out of Okinawa to mainland Japan, um, had to switch up certain things. Mm-hmm. To become more palatable, palatable to Japanese people, the Japanese public, right? Uh, you're a very strong identity, national identity. Uh, to hedge his bets for success of bringing karate to the world, starting with the outlet of Japan, and so this is how you get these subtle differences, uh, uh, visually and in ideology, as well, between uh, maybe some of the styles that are laying claim directly to Okinawa. Uh, versus something like a Shotokan. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and on the surface, they're very, you know, the, the length of the stance, how deep they are, what we call things, uh, Pinon Katas versus Pinon Katas. Pinon was thought to sound a little too Chinesey, so they got turned into Hinon, which basically means the same thing mm-hmm. uh, as, as, as Pinon does, which is the peaceful Katas. So, uh, but what's very interesting is, uh, along with that migration over to Japan is where we get the classic idea of karate, mm-hmm. right? Of, uh, um, uh, people in white uniforms with different colored belts and this more militaristic, uh, regimented, um, if, if American conforming a phalanx for the class to how they're responding to the instructor. Which I think is a direct result of bringing it out of Okinawa. They didn't necessarily practice it that way on the, on the islands, on the Ryukyu Islands. Um, and certainly, so like the karate uniform is, is, is borrowed from judo. A lot of people don't know that. And there's a lot of people who practice karate who train at it mm-hmm. who may not know that. Right. No, there was no uniform for karate. And there's a reason why Gichi Funakoshi decided to go that way. And he thought that it was a great way to help alleviate the strain of a very clearly delineated and enforced class system. So now you didn't have to, there was no class in, uh, there were classes in karate class, right? Right. And, and to mean that, you know, so the deference, the idea of showing deference was kind of redirected. Uh, from showing someone that, uh, deference just because they come from a higher class than you. Mm-hmm. And then post World War II, you know, all bets were off. And this is where you get a lot of the military uh, flavoring of what we typically think a karate class is. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, the lines, the rank and file, the sharp barking of orders and things of that nature are this is not, that's not the part of karate that's hundreds of years old, right? Mm-hmm thousands of years old or whatever. Uh, I think you'd be hard pressed for a style that can literally say it's been unchanged for thousands of years. There's no way, you know, if this is a living thing, right. that's going to change. 
it's going to ebb, it's going to flow, and it's right. obviously going to, yeah. The, the, one of the great positives to come out of the going to Japan and getting that influence is you get, the, you get imbued with the samurai warrior spirit. Not that there was a lack of warrior spirit just with the Okinawan people, but it was different. You're also talking about people who were subjugated by the samurai. Right. So that's another, uh, you know, another uh, World War II, pro post-World War II thing, right? Uh, a blurring of the class line where the samurai were the, the, um, the professional warriors of society, the warriors of that society, everybody became part of the emperor's army. Right. Because they came, which was a great piece of psychology, I think, on the part <laughs> Japanese going into World War II is imbuing this idea of total war from their society uh, among their civilian population and having everybody tapped into the lineage, this warrior lineage, mm -hmm. right? Which before that, you got born into. If you were the son of a farmer, you were a farmer. Yeah. Your son was going to be a farmer and his son was going to be a farmer. You know, they stayed in the feudal era, you know, to about 200 years ago, there was, you know, still carrying swords. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe me, watch The Last Samurai. Yeah. Right? Which yeah. is actually a very interesting representation of, of what happens when uh, two cultures clash where one is so far advanced technologically mm -hmm. and and change on tech, you know. There's a lot of, a lot of pros and cons that come out. A lot of potential, but a lot of chaos. You know? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. So I wanted to <clears throat> explain. So martial arts is very, I, I want to say it's imbued or embedded in me as far as like a bloodline goes, because you're not the only martial artist or notable martial artist in yes. my family. On uh, yes. mom's side, there is my grandfather's brother, Hanshi Pete Serengano Sr. Pete Serengano yeah. Jr., Rest in peace for yeah, both of them. Fun. Yeah, very well respected name. Uh, the oldest, oldest jujitsu school in New York. Period. All stop. Yeah, I would probably go as far as to say probably the oldest, short of any judo uh, classes that may have been taught at the time. Probably one of the oldest uh, Eastern martial arts schools in mm -hmm. New York City. Yeah, or none. Yeah, let's not take that. That was open to everybody. I'm, Maybe I should preface it that way, right? You know, because I'm pretty sure that the the Chinese who had been here forever were, were doing their thing, uh, but it was closed off. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, that was another big thing coming out of the '70s, where you had non Asians showing this interest and this willingness to sub to submit themselves in order to learn, right? And it was a um, I, I can't recall the title of it, but there was a uh, independently made, and by independently made. This is somebody with a camcorder on their shoulder, a uh, mm -hmm. documentary of racism within, martial, uh, within the martial arts during the That's 70s. Uh, and then there were, there were a couple of them. Uh, there, there's another one whose title I do remember and I cannot find. So if anybody can find it, it'd be interesting to see it. Yeah. Uh, interesting. To see it. It's called Ashy Knuckles. It's Ashy. a separate one. Ashy Knuckles. But the idea of being a man of color or a person of color who was. Um, interested in learning especially the traditional uh traditional kung fu yeah it was a lot harder than karate karate was a little a little more open and so not that kung fu wasn't being taught to uh to non-asians but it was being taught with a lot of reserve right and not just white the reserve was toward everybody and then of course you know there's that whole that whole gradient of uh, how well or poorly you get treated, depending on how light or dark you are. Right. Right. And these are the realities of what the times were at the time. Mm -hmm. But again, the, the great, the great, uh, the great equalizer was World War II and Korea. So you had these vets coming back, which is the case with your, with your uncle, with your great uncle, mm -hmm. Pete Sarangano, you know, a Korean War vet, uh, very well trained. Had, took on an additional interest to what he was being taught as far as hand-to-hand -hand survival skills right. out of the military. Um, and he got bit by the bug and he brought it back home. And this is, this is, and his story is not 
specific to just him. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys, that is their story. Right? So, and it's really interesting because you you see, you don't you don't see it to the extent coming out of Vietnam vets uh, as you do with Korean vets mm -hmm. and post-World War II vets. But it's really funny. It took them a really long, but it was the Korean War vet era mm -hmm. person that really Took that it really blew up. Yeah, it took off with it here. Yeah. But uh, I think it's just because the times are changing. And so, and then what was happening with television, the movie, the movie that did it for the Western world, for the United States specifically, was Five Fingers of Duck. Mm -hmm. Right? Low Lake, directed by Chang Che. It's a, and it's a run, run short film. And so that's one of the biggies. And it set off this whole explosion. So by the time, you know, uh, uh, Bruce Lee is getting to be seen here, separate from his Green Green Hornet stuff. Yeah, the Cato show. Intensely popular, right? And his and the guest spots on Batman and Robin. Um the the fuse was already lit. Bruce Lee was the dynamite. Mm -hmm. And then you know, you had Ron Ron Shore was pumping out several movies, a dozen movies a year, <laughs> capitalizing on the Kung Fu craze. And then that's how you get into your little, you know, five five venom and, and and all that and all this other stuff. Um, and it's really interesting because when I look at those actors, there's not much age difference between me and those actors. In some cases, less than ten years. Yeah. So, but these are very well trained, very trained, very well trained actors. Mm -hmm. They come out of one or two schools. You come out of the Kashin Opera, where you taught a theatrical version of the martial arts. Or you train the martial arts, right? Right. right. The long car lung types, right? And so, if you like Drunken Master, if you haven't seen Man Monkey starring Mark Long, Lung, you got to check that out. I got to put That's it on the one. list. Um, so I, the list—it's an ever-growing list. Um, so I wanted to to ask, what is your current rank now in Goju Ryu? Because you've been so, you've been a black belt as long as I I feel like yeah as long as I've so been alive. I you know I I I I got I earned my rank in Goju Ryu right um, I hold my current rank out of uh, Shura Jitsu uh, under the auspices of uh, of Hanshi uh, Louis Toledo mm -hmm. Maplewood Karate Maplewood New Jersey so I'm a, I'm a fifth degree black belt and uh, and yeah that's that's what that is. Okay. So, um I wanted to to ask what is your your kind of favorite part about getting to that rank in in martial arts? Was it the grind? Was it the the countless hours of, you know, uh, cleaning the dojo? Well, it changes. Yeah, 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 it changes the time. Um so when I was a younger man, you can't do what you can't do what I got in, involved with, and I think this is true of any physical endeavor of this mm -hmm. nature, <clears throat> the fight game, professional bodybuilding, wrestling, stuff like that. You got to be a little bit of a pain fiend. You got to get off on pain because you're going to be in pain. Right. And not necessarily because somebody's inflicting it on you, is that you're asking your body to do a lot, mm -hmm. right? To do things that it doesn't want to do. And in some cases, it feels very unnatural to do. <laughs> and so um, when I was a younger person, you know, I really I really got off on that. I got off on that soreness. Um, I really, I enjoyed thumping. You know, my dojo was a fighting dojo. And when I say my dojo, I mean my 400 years dojo, mm -hmm. meaning Kwan. And it wasn't, we didn't have a class. Even, even if it was a kata class, like what you see now, kata class, kata only, we fought. We fought every day we stepped on the deck. And I would I would hazard to say, especially then, that the only other professional athlete that performed at a high level uh, injured as often as karate practitioners were professional wrestlers. Hmm. Well, and I have a lot of respect for professional wrestlers. Scripted, not scripted, doesn't matter. We're talking about an athleticism, you, you're a willingness to to, again, make your body do things that it may not necessarily want to do. And right. in some cases, it may not be healthy for it over the long term. Right. So, um, so yeah, there, you know, when we're talking about high, high, 
high level performing athletes performing injured professional wrestlers come in first karate guys come in takes second. karate guys come in second okay so i don't know maybe not so much these days but certainly back then right so um now that i know i i always thought you were a goji ryu through and through has there been a certain style you've always wanted to kind of like dip your toe into but haven't really gotten an opportunity to yeah i you know i uh so i've been exposed to a lot of different types of martial arts over the years mm -hmm. uh, uh and and practice and you know i'm an under rank in uh, short and root, uh karate uh very traditional even more so than than uh than than the dojo i grew up in um so traditional that they don't they don't practice uh, freestyle uh, uh kumite um and they have their reasons you know so it kind of leads me to a question that i'm constantly asked uh once strangers find out that i train mm -hmm. um which if you sit down with me more than five minutes i'm going to tell you yeah or somebody somebody else is going to tell you because it is such a big part of my life yeah and so the difference between styles, and I would go, and this is not just true for karate, but this is true for the difference between karate and kung fu, the different styles in kung fu, the different styles in karate versus capoeira versus, you know, uh, kali or screamo mm -hmm. is, um, is very subtle. The, the difference is, is uh, in ideology and method of training. You know, how you train is the method and why you train it that way is the ideology. Right. And so what happens is with the different styles is you'll often hear, especially when somebody's selling a karate school, selling a karate class, how their art, their, their, their type of art is a complete art, mm -hmm. right? But then you look at it and you say, well, where's the grappling? Or where's the throws? Or where's the punching? Right. And it's not that it isn't there. Unfortunately, what happens is, and this is part of the splintering. This is the part of there's a point where karate becomes yours and then you go and do something with it. Mm -hmm. And so you start to specialize. So with karate, the fist became the subspecialization of karate. Karate is known for its punches of being able to put its hand through anything. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, judo, judo bounce you off the planet and jujitsu hits you with the weight of the planet when they throw you. And right. that's not to say that you don't have throws in karate because they're there. But because they started specializing in this, you see more work with this. Mm -hmm. And then this, this other stuff, the grappling, the trapping, the chokes, the strangles. Um, that's what your journey becomes when you make rank for me that's the way it works okay so that's the only way that's the only way it makes sense for me and so what happens unfortunately is that everybody's journey is different mm -hmm. and everybody's in a different place developmentally so for instance I'll, I'll recount a quick story that happened a bunch of years ago uh you know i was working someplace in the city and the it guy who was a little older than me got to talking you don't talk more than five minutes with me before I turn the conversation to martial arts in general. Right. And it turns out that this guy practiced uh, Higaona Gojuro for many, many years. And um, at the time of the conversation, according to him, his his departing rank was like second second degree, third degree black belt. But mm -hmm. he, he wasn't currently, tra currently training. And so I asked him, this is, you know, well, why did you why did you move away to Life gets in the way, no doubt about it. I mean, I walked away for many years and came back and walked away and came back, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you have other obligations, right? So, and you only have so many hours in the day. And so, you know, I wanted to go down that road with him to understand. And we we got into the only largest, I could turn into a screaming match, actually. Um, I got heated because yeah. his answer to me, and I was expecting the typical and, you know, white kids, this, that, kids from school, work. Uh, and it wasn't any of that. And it was, you know, I kind of moved his answer to me. But I moved away from it because, you know, there was no there was no throws. There was no throws. And I was like, what do you mean there's no throws? 
So it tells me one or two things. If you weren't there, he was there yet developmentally, or the instructor wasn't there developmentally to teach him. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. But to have somebody who put in the time to make me down in a style and, and come back and say, well, you know, it's missing this, it's missing that, and it's missing the other thing, then that tells me either your instructor came up short or you didn't drill deep enough in your own style. Mm -hmm. Because there's a point you got to go outside of yourself and you got to look. Ultimately, it's show me. Ultimately, you know, you, you can't, you don't take anybody's word for anything. You have to do your due diligence. Right. You know, and, and what works for one may not necessarily work in the exact same way for another. Mm -hmm. A six foot six man doesn't use his body like a five foot six man does. Right. Right. So let alone, uh, you know, a five foot ten woman. You know, so there's a point where you got to make karate yours. And if you can't find what you need in your style, I would submit the problem is not the style. The problem is you, and maybe that's not the style for you. Right. Right. So it's going to be one of those two things. So, um, especially in this day and age where you don't, there isn't much of that standoff reservedness on the part of instructor to student as it once was. Now, having said that, I will also say this, you know, the typical grind that you see now is nothing, nothing compared to the grind I went through. Right. You know? It's it's a lot softer, it's a lot uh, kinder, gentler, and it's not. And I'm not saying it's less, and I'm not saying it's more. But I am denoting that there's a difference, right? You know, there is a difference. I'm sure there is. So, essentially, when it comes to martial arts, you, it's kind of like with MMA, where you have different fighters who have different styles, and they adapt different styles to different situations. And sure. from what it sounds like, is you kind of pick and choose what you're lacking and what you need out of what you're essentially doing. Yes, but but it should be there. Right. It should be there. So like for instance, even even the dabbling that I've done with other with other martial arts uh was always with the idea of trying to understand where it is in my own karate. Got it. So when I stepped on a Aikido deck, Rockland Aikido, when Matsumura, really, really nice guy, really cool guy. Didn't take many classes with it. But when I did do that, um, I did it with the idea of trying to find own style from, from what he was doing. Right. Because that became their sub-specialization. It's not that Aikido doesn't have punches. It has plenty of punches. It's not that Aikido doesn't have kicks. It has plenty of kicks. But their, their intentions are different and the mythologies are different. Mm -hmm. So, no, you're not going to necessarily get a head kick from an Aikido practitioner. And they don't need to do it. Right. They don't need to do it, not for the way they fight. So, now, I got to point out a difference here with when we're talking about MMA, as I think we, I understand how you're, you're talking about it. Mm -hmm. So, we're talking about UFC, that kind of thing, Bellator. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's, a, a, there's a major divide in a lot of ways between um, traditional martial arts, you know, uh, martial arts and this idea of MMA. Mixed martial UFC. arts. Right. Mixed martial arts always existed. As long as you had guys who were practicing and there was somebody else that was practicing a different style, they were mixing it up. Right. Believe me. As a matter of fact, you were charged to study your opponent's style. So you knew how to deal with them. Right. So. But when we're talking about UFC and things of that nature, we're talking about a blood sport, sport martial arts. Their, their mythology and their ideology is vastly different than what we're doing in a, in a karate studio or a mm -hmm. keto, in a dojo, <clears throat> a, a dojang, taekwondo, what have you, from, from these traditional, more traditional, um, uh, even the kung fu guys. You know, MMA and uh, Bellator and those athletes are, and the people who teach that method of fighting are not interested in your character development. Mm -hmm. They could care less. Are you going to win the match? That is the, I the ideology. That's the mentality. Right. It's all weapon, no development, or very little development. Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly enough, 
You know, uh, I think a lot of the reigning champions have their basis in these more traditional arts. Mm -hmm. And consequently, we're seeing a resurgence. Because remember, I go back to the beginning of ultimate fighting competitions and those those type of tough guy. Right. I remember the first ones, you know, um, where it was the, the, the sport was being dominated by stand-up fighters, traditional martial artists. So when we're talking in terms of UFC, we got to remember that that's a vehicle for Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. That, that is a marketing vehicle, and that's what it started out as, and it's gone its own life. Yeah. But it's really designed, you know, for this almost starting from a prone position type of fighting. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's, without, it's not without its merit. Absolutely has its merit. I'm just saying it's something different. Yeah. And interestingly enough, we see this resurgence of the stand-up fighting champion. These champions whose uh, base, uh, the, the very basic uh, part of the warrior that they are is coming out of this more traditional martial art, whether it's Taekwondo, whether it's Judo, whether it's Karate, any one of those forms, mm -hmm. which is interesting. You know? Yeah. And so when we're talking about differences, I'm sorry to when we're talking about differences, we got to understand something. Mm -hmm. A human body only, if you're very lucky, has five appendages, uh, you know, counting your head. And so there, there are only a finite number of ways one can use the human body. So chances are you're going to see this again, yeah. no matter where in the world it's coming from. What differentiates it is, like I said, ideology and method of training. Mm -hmm. right? The jiu-jitsu guy with a Greco-Roman wrestling guy that's a different, they're fighting two different fights. Right. They train different. The way they think about fighting is different. Doesn't mean they can't fight, but because one wins over the other, it doesn't necessarily preclude that the loser style is the weaker style. Right. It's just different. It's the metal of the fighter. Right, right. It's not the size of the, the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. dog. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, because you were speaking about resurgence. Um, I kind of wanted to segue into uh, when you were talking about the 70s and 80s, Kung Fu movies were huge. When I was a kid, <laughs> 90s to, I mean, 80s to 90s, I, we were talking about it before the, the power went out or the internet went out. Ninja Turtles was a huge thing. Uh, yeah. Power War, Rangers. Power Rangers. Mortal, Mortal Kombat. Kombat. Mortal Kombat. Yeah. PS1, man. Oh. Classic. Side so, <laughs> my question is, there's going to be, there are a few things that are coming out. New Mortal Kombat movies coming out in April. They're right. Marvel, one of the biggest uh, studios in the world now, uh, are right. currently working on a Shang, uh, Shang-Chi movie, which I would have never thought they were going to make a Shang-Chi movie, but yeah. here we are. We live in strange times. Right. Do you think right. with all of these new things coming out that, this will cause like a resurgence or a um, kind of a, a renaissance of that kind of like seventies to nineties you know, martial arts. Craze. I think that's a hard call. I think that's a hard call to make because I think in the early nineties, we saw an attempt coming out of the Hong Kong uh, uh, film industry mm -hmm. to try to recapture those days. Right. And there was a lot of great film coming out of Hong Kong. at that time. Uh, anybody who's a Jet Li fan, if you haven't seen his earlier stuff, you need to do yourself a favor. And I'm talking about like his early stuff when he was 19, 20 years old. Yeah. Uh, everything from um, uh, it's a Shaolin, one of the many Shaolin movies. His if Jet Li has a ponytail, like, then you know you're yeah, in yeah, the early shoe. Uh, yeah. The Once Upon a Time in America series, mm -hmm. uh, the Once Upon a Time in China series, uh, Iron Monkey is another one, uh, Don Yen actually a really good one so that era of film and then that's not counting the action films uh the hong kong action films that were coming out right all the john Wu stuff you know uh uh starring chow young fat bullet to the head of better tomorrow and you know that kind of thing so i think unfortunately what happened coming out of the 70s and 80s is you saw an oversaturation of asian flavored combative arts on screen premiate every production being produced mm -hmm. where 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 media got lousy with it and if you don't believe me 
go on Netflix, binge watch Star Trek Next Generation, <laughs> and just watch war through this thing, you know? Yeah. And that's a very good example of that. So we become callous to it. We become whole hum to it. And I, I don't think you'll ever capture the uh, the zeitgeist, you know, the spirit of the times mm-hmm. that, that you see back in the 60s and 70s. And I think there's a lot of reason for that, especially in the movies, you know, the spy, the Cold War, which led to the spy films, which led to the idea of this one lone guy. But I could go, you know, you could go even further than that and go into the, into the cowboy films. You know, into into the spaghetti westerns and the idea, the character that may that may claim this was career, the unknown anti-hero, you know, thing. Uh, so I think it was a culmination of all these things that allows us to see this golden era of martial arts in general uh, mm-hmm. coming out of the sixties and seventies and well into the eighties. But you know, by the mid to late eighties, it, it was on its it was waning. Right. You know, and then uh, because, again, it was oversaturated, you know, there is such thing as too much of a good thing. Right. And then yeah. and then it gets it gets satirized. Right. Mm-hmm. So we, we have a tendency to fear what we don't know. And one of the ways we express our fear is through ridicule. So that's the other end of it as well. Right. Mm-hmm. So by diminishing it. And there's been a lot of that too, you know, Kung Pao, cool flick. Love that. Flick. But you no, know, you're satirizing it. And, and right. I get that because it's been done so much and people are still on the fence about it. And so consequently, like with me and when I teach, one of the ideas that I and I, I got a whole very well developed uh, undercurrent of um, ideology and philosophy that helped calibrate my moral compass in, in terms of being an instructor. Mm-hmm. or a practitioner at large um, is to to take the mysticism out of martial arts take the wool out of it yeah and that's the big difference between like my generation or where I find myself in, in my development currently compared to what I encountered when I was first coming through the machine there was still a lot of misconceptions yeah uh, there was still a lot of misunderstandings you know you could go in the back of any any comic book, and you know, uh, and 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 see advertisements. You know, for three dollars, we'll teach you the deadly art of you know yeah. the mock <laughs> and the delayed death touch and, and, and oversimplifications, uh, uh, representations of oversimplification of much deeper ideas. Right. And so, um, and I think there's still a lot of that around. You know. I think that it's so in my own travels, I, I found that when I was standing across from someone who was uh, actively ridiculing me for being a karate practitioner, and there are people out there, that it's good yeah. shit. Um, if given the opportunity to, to drill in deeper, you they always make the same confession. And I paraphrase because everybody puts, you know, expresses themselves differently. Mm-hmm. But it's always, you know, I was always interested in that. But, you know, I was always kind of nervous about getting down with it. And, yeah, if you're a punk, you should have just knuckled up. Right. But that explains your behavior today as a grown man. And how you fix it to get your ass whooped well, if you keep with your shit. So, you know, it's really interesting yeah. um, uh, in, in one respect to see how that plays out. Right. And a lot of that has to do with the media that we consume. A lot of it has to do with those movies that we grew up with. Your grandfather, he he chuckled. He'd laugh his ass off whenever I was watching a Kung Fu flick. He called it the lie, the lie movies. You know, <laughs> bah, bah, bah. You know, how's a guy jump off a mountain, land on his pinky? You know, yeah. It, it was that crazy, you know. But yet he was suspend his disbelief, and he was a he loved the eighteen. He thought, you know, it was. <laughs> The greatest thing is a slice break. You can eat the 18, but you can't, you know, you can't watch five deadly venoms with me. So it, it's all, it's all, you know, what your sensibilities are. Yeah. And so, yeah, I don't know that, you know, I hope there is a resurgence. I think that uh, I know for me, particularly, I, I'm a lot better human being when I'm very active with my training, mm-hmm. uh, very active with my practice. Um not so much when I'm not. And, uh, you know, it, 
I, I hope there is, especially nowadays. I think this is it's, it's a better it's something everyone can benefit from. Yeah, you know, um, and it's not it's not such a wide gap between you know what one is trying to accomplish with say something as pass, passive seeming as yoga. Yeah, versus something as dynamic physically as taekwondo or karate or kung fu. You know. Mm -hmm. um, that's not such a that's not such a, a wide divide. All all roads lead to Rome, right? You know, it's just how you get there. Exactly, and I I love that uh, you were discussing about the kind of like um, the kind of I don't want to say stereotypes, but essentially the stereotypes that comes with um, people who see others who do karate. So I kind of wanted to ask, like, right. for an Especially adult. Adults. Exactly. Yeah. So for adult who say interested to get into it for the first time, or maybe after 14 years and they stopped when they were in high school and, <laughs> <laughs> and they have that kind of like, well, shit, people are going to judge me. They're going to think I'm going to be wearing like white pajamas and then just doing right. circle blocks. Like right. there, there is definitely a fear and a, like a stigma with that. But, sure, sure. And I think yeah. it's real. Uh, so, you know, what, what I say to that is, first of all, if you're if you're in your 30s and you're worrying about, uh, you know, stuff like what people are going to think of you because you're practicing karate, mm -hmm. then you're exactly the right person that karate is for. Right. Right. Not not. And in this respect, in this regard, I should say um, to, to try to get some of that for that mental fortitude, that character fortitude. Right. Uh, try to develop some of that uh, because I would hazard if you're a drinker, you really don't give a shit what people are thinking of you when you're rambling and ambling down the street acting ass. That doesn't seem to bother you, right? And, and right. there's very little positive that comes from from that practice. So to not engage, you know, it, it, I think the fear is is even more inherent than what are other people going to say. They're afraid of getting physically hurt. Yeah. They're afraid of getting physically hurt, which is really interesting. When you when you first approached the subject of interviewing me, this is one of one of the things I certainly wanted to talk about mm -hmm. is safety in martial arts training. Now, I've trained in martial arts, I've trained in different styles of martial arts. Uh, and here's something you may or may not know. I even tried my hand at boxing for a while. Really? Because it is no, right? Uh, I have a boxer's no. Yes, you definitely have a so, bunch of those. I don't like getting hit in the face. That's number one. Nobody <laughs> does. No. And everybody's got a fight plan to you punch him in the face. Um, but I got to tell you, you know, walking around with loose teeth, black eyes, and, and you know, and spitting blood, I I never got loose teeth as a consequence of uh, practicing martial arts. Mm -hmm. even, even as rough as some of the sparring could get. Do accidents happen? Absolutely. You zig when you should have zagged. You know, the guy yeah. was a little faster than your reflexive action was. You moved in. Maybe you should have moved out, but now it's too late. So you're going to eat that foot. So did that happen? Yeah. Yeah. But the idea, because, you know, and I understand where that fear comes from as well. And I try to make it very clear uh, to students I take on, you know, especially the more mature ones. Mm -hmm. The byproduct of our endeavor is life and death. The ability to grant or take life. Right. And I think about it in those terms. Because that's that's heavy. And yeah. that keeps you honest, keeps me honest. Uh, on, you know, on a moralistic level. So so having said that, as an instructor, you know, my one of one of the things I'm committed to, I want to make sure everybody goes home with all their teeth. Right, because you're going to look kind of funny trying to eat corn. On. And so, if if I'm your instructor, you're coming to me fresh. You're whatever age you are now. Even if you were a kid, even if you're a little older than you are now. And every time we stand across from you, every time you leave my school, you're limping out. There's yeah. going to be a point where you don't walk in, man. And that's not that's not the point. The training. And if that's what's happening on the deck, then I I we got to revisit what's happening on the deck. Yeah. Right. Are we are we playing, you know, dominant some sum, 
submissive games over here? You mm-hmm. know, are we doing pecking order here or are we are we training? Are we practice? Are we trying to be the best us we can be? And right. are we doing that collaboratively? Because there is a collaborative effort to the endeavor. Right. So, and, and you know, there's a lot of dichotomy with martial arts, uh, which, you know, again, oversimplification of Eastern ideas where Eastern ideas are all paradoxical. They're not. As you drill down, they start making a lot of lot of sense. There's nothing. Nothing is black and white. Nothing. Life is oversimplified. Life is very complicated. Yeah. Life is very complicated. And so, you know, that's that's the meaning of the word dojo. It's it's a place of learning, a cosmic place of learning. So this is where we learn about the world. Good, the bad, the ugly, the bumps, the scrapes, the love, the adoration, the chastisement. And this is where we learn this safely, physically as well as, you know, emotionally and spiritually. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be a place of judgment, not that kind. Right. You know, and it's, if anything, someplace where you can have your ego check, you know, because ultimately you got to show me either, you know what you say, you know, or you don't. Right. You know, you could be mistaken. So, um, you know, so people who have that concern, especially adults, listen, it's never too late to start anything. It's only too late after you're dead, you know? Yeah. And Morahai Yeshiba, he's the founder of, of Aikido, said if if a heat, the man was on the deck three days before he died of stomach cancer at a very elevated age, teaching the small fry. And if I had to choose the way I'm going to croak, that's the way I want to croak. You know, not while the kids are there, of course. No. <laughs> that, kind of, that, that kind of deal. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Guy died doing what he loved. Yeah. You know? And, and so, he, and he said, you know, if you have the energy and, and the physical wherewithal to walk across the floor and turn a doorknob, you can do a keto. And that's true of anything. That's yeah. true of any endeavor. You know, can I kick, can I hit the ceiling anymore or light fixtures with a kick? Hell no, I'm 52 years old. <laughs> you know, um, but that's not, that's not what it's about for me anymore. Right. So what we find, going back to your earlier question about, you know, what what the gains are of training, um, you know, what I was getting off on in my training, you know, what right. gravitated me to it and what kept me there, it changed. It changed with my own development. Mm-hmm. It changed with time. And that's the beauty of that. It's like playing guitar, man. You can leave it in that corner and you come back to it three years later. Yeah, you're rusty, but the guitar is still waiting for you. Your friend is still there. All you got to do is pick it up. Right. So uh, and, and karate is like that. Martial arts is like that, too. No, you, I, I may not physically perform the way I did when I was 20 years old, 17 years old. I'm not that guy anymore. Right. Either. Right. So your benefits, the benefits I get from training have changed throughout time. It's still pretty nice. I got to tell you, there's something empowering about walking into a room full of people looking around the room and. And saying to myself, yeah, I, I can pretty much bounce just about everybody in this room off the walls at will, and there isn't a goddamn thing they can do about it. Right. Not that I act on it, but there's something empowering about that. Yeah. Right. And so that certainly has its dividends. Um, yeah, you know, and so when I get into these conversations about people who are on the fence about picking up some kind of class, uh, some kind of training, whether it's kickboxing or keto jiu-jitsu judo i had a guy I, I worked with a couple of years older than me never practiced a stitch of martial arts in his life started training jiu-jitsu in his early 50s loving it yeah. loving it and still doing it four years later three years later and That's so fantastic. uh and he, you know he credits me for that and i'm like I, I have no credit for that you already knew what you wanted to do i i'm, I'm the guy who came along and told you it was okay that is it yeah you already knew that, but you needed to hear it. So, you know, sometimes we still need exterior validation for what we already know the truth to be. Mm-hmm. Right. And we all need that. And I was happy to, I'm happy I was able to serve in that, in that capacity for this individual. And and so my conversations with people like that is, I don't, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a style snob. Do something, anything. It doesn't matter what it is, man. Batminton, ping yeah. pong, you know, Ikebana, you know. How are you expressing yourself or are you oppressed? Are you stifled? 
because ultimately that's what it comes down to for me. Yeah. How am I expressing myself? And how is, how is this, is what I'm spending time on helping me become better than I was yesterday? Mm -hmm. right? Because that's something we should all be working on at all you know, throughout our lives. Yeah. Uh, that's my opinion. Anyway. And some things help you become a better man than you were yesterday. And some things don't, some things are time wasters. Right. Um, so, you know, my, my conversations with that, I, I don't, I don't necessarily try to sell Goju Ru or, or, or Choron Ru or any, uh, you know, Keto, whatever. Uh, I get the question a lot. What's the best style? What's the difference between styles? And, and I, I don't try to push any given agenda mm -hmm. for me. With very few exception, uh, all 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 different style, all different types of martial arts are valid. Does it get you moving? Yeah, you know. Does it help you move away from the couch? Does it help you put the goddamn phone down for two minutes? That whole other and and that's another big difference from 60s, 70s, and 80s, and even early 90s. Yeah. So now there's a lot more. There's a lot not. More, not just more content, but stronger chains mm -hmm. to hold your attention than ever before. Also, and that's some gratification. Sure. Well, so, yeah. you know, one of the keys to success is delayed gratification. And that's not me saying this. They did the tests. Yeah. Just, that's one of the first, one of, one of the most best documented ideas in psychology is the idea of the ability to put off your gratification and your chances of being successful later in life go hand in hand. Very well documented, mm -hmm. very well experimented. And, and I, my experience bears it out. You know, I'm all about instant gratification. Most human beings are. It's why I like to paint and sweep floors. Yeah. Very easy, very easy instant gratification. You see that? That shit was dirty. Now it's clean. You know, that kind of deal. Yeah. Um, ironing. You know, the idea of ironing my gi, ironing my dress shirts. And I do all my own ironing. My wife's never touched the iron. I iron her stuff. One is therapeutic for me. It's a physical endeavor I can engage in. It doesn't require me to be there, mm -hmm. which means I can let my mind wander. Um, and it feeds my need for instant gratification in a positive way. Yeah. And so, you know, being able to identify those things becomes important as well. And one hopes that that is also, you know, a byproduct, a, a part and parcel of, of my training. Yeah. So because we talked about uh, the differences between the 70s to 90s uh, of that karate culture, current year, let's say I'm a parent. And my child has expressed any mild interest in Taekwondo or karate. Right. It's a very, you know, I remember, uh, you know, meeting other people's kids and they're, you're like, oh yeah, tell them about your karate. And, you know, every, like, it seems like every kind of kid has a karate phase. So, right. how, so but I think yeah. that's, that's an extension of the parent, right? Because the parent is going to be, someone who um, has been directly influenced from the 60s, 70s, 80s karate craze. Mm. So the idea, especially with the younger parents, so the idea that when you have kids, one of the things you do is you put your kid in karate is an expectation, right? Uh, if it's your daughter, you put in dance. Well, either sex or child, you can put in karate. And there are just certain things yeah certain things that are kind of our expectation which is not necessarily a bad thing you know I, I think about things like that the way i think about um feeding children right throw everything at them they're going to let you know soon enough what they like and don't like right but you got to expose them to as much as possible and they may surprise you right yeah and that doesn't and it doesn't mean to say that tastes don't change with time and it's funny because i was having this conversation a little earlier today uh, with, a, with a very good friend of mine whose uh, both sons are in jiu-jitsu. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me, he was juxtapositioning the one against the other. And the one kid, man, he's he's living, breathing this shit. And the other kid's, eh. I was like, yeah, well, you know, listen. And then he's telling me, uh, you know, but 
And so I, I feel comfortable that he can take care of himself physically. Right. He's going to do this if I got to drag him by his hair. And so, you know, my answer to that is, hey, listen, you know, he, he may not want it. This may not be for him. Right. May not be for him. He might be a Greco-Roman wrestler. You know, he might be a, a badminton player. Yeah. He might be a poet. It may not be for him. Uh, and also, that's not to say that I can't flip flop because the one that's crazy about it now can wake up one morning, turned off, and then the one that you thought would never get down ends up being your your Olympian. Yeah. So you never can tell. All you can do is express, uh, expose. Mm -hmm. All you can do is expose them. Let it be there. Let it be the guitar in the corner collecting dust, waiting to be strummed. And and when 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 the moment is right, if it's meant to be, next thing you know, you know you got. You got Jimmy Page on your hands, man. So that's the hope. That's the yeah. hope. That's the hope, right? Of so you, you're playing the odds. Uh, you throw everything you can and see what sticks. So, you know, I think that the idea, uh, you know, what you were saying at the parent, uh, it seems like everything down with the body. Yeah, but the other thing, too, is do they stick with it? Do they rank? Do they not make rank? You know, I think most karate schools and, and studios and dojos should have a revolving door in the front. It's just what that is. Mm -hmm. And it's ever been that way. You know, uh, the washout rate for people getting black belt is high. Yeah. It's high. You know, and to, you know, and then what's worse is they, they make rank and then you don't see them no more. Like, like, like they graduated and there's nothing yeah. else to learn, which is bullshit. It's a lifelong endeavor. And it's, you know, I equate it with, with buying a sword, right? Okay. When people come to me about buying a sword and, you know, what, what's a good price? What should I pay for it? What do you want to pay? What do you want to pay? What are you looking to do with it? You could buy a $30 sword, which will work perfectly fine for what your usage is, or you could spend $3 million on something you're never going to swing. What do you want to pay? Yeah. So that's kind of a very similar attitude that I think, you know, to go through, spend the time, spend the money, and then do nothing with it. It's like getting a driver's license and not and not driving. Yeah. Why wouldn't you drive? You know, there's something, again, liberating about that. So, um, and I'm not saying that, you know, every person who steps foot into a karate school should stick at it until, you know, they die. I'm, that's not what I'm saying at all. Right. But. It's really interesting that, so I get the one or, or two types of stories. I always wanted to get down, but, you know, I, I, I was kind of a punk. I couldn't really, you know, I couldn't, not not in those words, but, you yeah, know, I was yeah. always kind of, it's too, or, yeah, I used to train, you know, a long time. And so part of the recruiting that I do, um, that I'm looking to do is, it's guys just like you who I want to do something with aside from the traditional mm -hmm. karate program. These are older guys who, who trained always with the idea of going back to the dusty guitar, but life gets in the way. And then you get to a point where you feel kind of stupid doing it fresh. Right. It's one thing you're a middle-aged man and you're a second degree black belt. And another thing, if you're a middle-aged man and it's the first time you're putting the pajamas on. Yeah. Right. Because we, we have ego. We have ego mm -hmm. and, and people feel foolish. If I put an adult in a child's class, they're going to feel foolish. But I defy any adult be able to stick with any kid in a kid's class, exercise for exercise. Can't be done. You're not going to do it. You're going to yeah. croak. You're going to gas out before that happens. They're all energy. No more than a child will be able to give you the level of attention for the length of time you hope you would get out of adults. But that's sketchy. Mm -hmm. right? And there are reasons for that. But um but yeah, that's you know that's how I feel about that. Okay. Uh, you know, I I think you're right. I think that uh, it's almost an expectation that if you have kids, that you would put your kids in karate. Yeah. Not necessarily a bad thing, um, but then it's you know for the kid it's just one more thing, one more book in the book bag, yeah. one more thing mom's dragging me to that I don't want to go to. Exactly. You know, and so now you get turned off. Me, it was a little different. You couldn't keep me out. But life was different for me too. Yeah, the world was a different place. Um, you know, so the dojo for me became a place of solace. 
I could be myself. I didn't have to, you know, I grew up listening to, you know, you should know better and having to live up to other people's expectations. Mm -hmm. And they weren't always clear in what their expectations were. And in the, in the dojo, there weren't many expectations, but they were absolutely clear, you know, yeah, especially in the beginning. Um, so, you know, it becomes a little, it was a little bit different dynamic. So that became the fallback. Um, and so as I got older and through my high school years, you know, if I wasn't at school or at work, I was practicing. I was either in the dojo or I was in the park so, or on my way to it. So what it seems like is regardless, even if there's a spark of interest uh, in anything or any kind of thing that you're curious about or passionate about to just kind of go for it and, and see. You should always, you. yeah, you got to try you gotta it. Entertain. Yeah, you got to entertain your passions. Uh, you should um, certainly um, pursue your interests. Yeah. Right. There's a big difference like when you're in school and you have your reading curriculum and reading the stuff you like yeah. are very rarely the same thing. And while you have no problem consuming very rapidly the things you like and enjoy, the things you don't become a grind. So, you know, if you enjoy something or if you think you have an eye, you know, I want to check that. Try it, man. What's it? What, what are you going to lose? Exactly. What do you, what do you got to lose to try? You know what I'm saying? And, and for people who are worried about what other people think, the easiest thing to do is ask, well, what the hell? Is, what are you doing? Yeah. What do you do? What do you do that's so fucking great? 40 pounds overweight. Drinking maybe a little too much. Not sleeping enough. Always complaining about how you don't have a life because you're always at work. What do you do? So at least I'm doing something. Yeah. Fuck out. You know what I'm saying? Even exactly. if it's writing poetry. Even if it's sketching. Even if it's coloring in a goddamn coloring book, what do you do compared to doing nothing? Well, I come home, you know, and I crack that and I rip through that six pack as quick as I can for that hour between the time I come home and the time I have dinner while I'm watching the game. I'm not that guy. And I don't understand that guy. Not judging it. I just don't get it. Comparatively speaking. Which is fair. You know, I'd, rather get in, I'd rather get in the car, drive the half hour to get to the karate school, thump and come back. At least I have a, a reason to be sore. Right. I got a reason to be achy. You know? So, so if someone's starting out, what's an expectation that they should have as far as like cost their first class? Uh, things in that regard. Right. So, um, all right. I'll try not to get too crazy with it, but <laughs> simplest terms so, like, right. So overall. there's a difference between a sport dojo, sport karate, and a more traditional karate school. Right. And the easiest way to express the difference there is, uh, in ter in these terms, a sports school, you're going to make rank real quick, but it's going to cost you a lot of money and it's all performance oriented. Mm -hmm. Winning. So it's a little closer to the UFC type of mentality. Like, right. So thinking like your Tiger Shulman's kind of karate. Absolutely. 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 Okay. Um, the more traditional type of program may not be as expensive. It's going to take you a hell of a lot more time to make rank because you've been, con you're concerning yourself with different things. Right. Right. Uh, especially if you're standing across from me, because I'm going to cram as much as as much as what I know into you as I possibly can. Um, that's just me. Right? Mm -hmm. That's just the person I am <clears throat> and the kind of instructor I am. So in terms of course, you know, anywhere between if, if, if you're joining joining a karate school, roughly speaking, it's going to be anywhere between one hundred and twenty five to one hundred fifty dollars a month. Mm -hmm. We get anywhere from three three to four classes out of that a week, uh, a month. Yeah. Right. Um, maybe, maybe closer to five, depending on what the schedule looks like. Right. On average for karate schools nowadays, you know, you, you get some, you make black belt within three or four years, you know, and that's putting time into it. Yeah. Um, definitely. So when I when I give advice about that, you know, definitely look at the fee structure, 
You don't want to get into um, programs where you're paying the year up front. Yeah. So, you know, those type of programs. Contracts, that kind of thing. Contracts, yeah. You know, I never understood that. Um, I do understand that. I mean, you know, you, you, you're doing it for a living and you got bills to pay and you're in this fancy space and you got overhead. Yeah. And that's a lot of what motivates that. Um, and it's a business like any other. And But what happens is the, the, the spirit of karate could get lost in the business of karate. Right. Um, and it's one of the things that I'm trying to be cognizant of uh, as I move move through my my instruction part of my development my life mm -hmm. so yeah you know so you know you break that math down and the some places may have a per week cost that they would charge or even a per class right and if you do the math will always be a little bit more expensive than just paying the monthly nut yeah and the, the studio owner needs that because you got a monthly nut to make right you know and you don't get rich teaching karate. You certainly do not get rich teaching no. karate. Um, and then the other thing, you know, I think that a prospective students, and if we're talking about children that parents need to understand is that, you know, it, it's the it's the the casual student that pays the bills. Yeah, it's the one offs. It's the one that comes for two, three, four months, and then you never see them again. Unfortunately, they're the ones that pay the bill, but they also are the ones that make it possible for your core group to have a dojo, to have a school, to have a place to come to, mm -hmm. you know, to pay. They, they basically make it possible for people like me who this is their destiny. They're good at it. They're going to do this to have a place to do that from. Mm -hmm. So you got a little symbiotic thing going on. Yeah. Uh, um, I think uh, one of the things I do is, but you know, my eye is a little different than than someone who maybe is not as educated, uh, particularly in karate. Is I, I like observing my children's classes. Mm -hmm. If I'm checking out a school, and I've done this for other people, check out a school for them, for their kid, um, or even for themselves as adults. Even schools that you know, places I've wanted, played around with the idea, maybe I could get down here, yeah, um, so I could I might have somebody to stand across from. Because it gets kind of lonely, you know, throwing punches by yourself in yeah. the room, punching the wall. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, is I, I like to observe my child classes. Mm -hmm. I like, I, I, you know, how the instructor interacts with the kids. More importantly, how the kids interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And the most telling is at the end of the class how the child's interacting with the parent. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, that's all part of it. You know, part of big part of what I do is to help reinforce, hopefully, what's happening at home. Right. Um, and help out with that as much as I can. So, yeah, cost is nominal, man. You know, it's it's like I said, $125 to $150 a month somewhere in that yeah. neighborhood. Uh, anything too low or too high from that should make you raise an eyebrow. Right. Um uh, you can tell how much you, you can expect to pay by the space that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. If it's a big space and a, and a big fancy strip mall, high overhead, man. Somebody's got to carry that nut. Yeah. Somebody's got to carry that nut. Uh, and it's not necessarily any indication of the quality of instructor. Of course not. It's just the, so, the cost. Right. So we kind of touched on what your favorite <clears throat> things are uh, about the hobby are. At least from different stages of your puppies. A couple of my favorite things. And, uh, <laughs> and one thing that you, uh, as, as we definitely got into what you don't like. What would you say right now is the most rewarding? After kind of like I know that you're you've been teaching for X amount of years. Has there been anything that you felt like? Yeah, well, I, I could. I help well, with that. Let me, let, let, yeah, let me try answer it this way first. Okay. The biggest dividend I believe I get to to training, mm -hmm. to practicing, to to being there personally, is the sense of fellowship. Yeah. Right. Of uh, being surrounded by uh, similarly thinking people uh, with similar views on like. Now that's not to say we're in lockstep because believe me, 
when you're standing in front of a karate class, you're dealing with a very interesting cross section of humanity mm-hmm. in terms of culture, in terms of uh, you know political bent, religion, sexuality, all the whole gambit, the right. whole everything that makes us human beings. So, but. You know, we, we all come to karate for very similar reasons, and there are not too many of them. And we all stay for karate for even less similar reasons. Right. They, right. they reduce the number. It comes down to one or two things. And in its essence, it's really the one thing. And so the idea of fellowship, the idea that when I'm training, I'm a better man, when, when I'm active somehow in that community than when I'm not. Mm-hmm. And to me, that those two things are actually the same thing. They're inseparable. Right. Right. One is an extension of the other. Uh, but I tell you, the moments I live for when I'm on the deck is when I have someone across from me who's struggling and all of a sudden there's a moment of illumination and I can see that light turn on in their eyes. Yeah. And they get it. And they're like, oh, wow. And it makes my hair stand up just talking about it. Um, and those are the moments I live for, you know, to see that spark of illumination in someone else. Because, you know, a lot of what we do is route. It's just done by route repetition, man, you know. And if you get how many punches can you throw? How many kicks can you throw? You know, uh, how do you keep that exciting for yourself? So there's a point where, like, I really get off on newbies. Yeah. I really, I really, you know, their excitement feeds me through my. You know, you get jaded. You get that that feeling of triteness. You know, it's you've done this so much that it's just man, it's over. I'm doing this again. You know, that kind of deal. Yeah. And so, but then that's also, you know, we we should take those opportunities. It, it is what leads us to go deeper down the rabbit hole. It doesn't mean the the hole stopped. You know, we might just be in a blind turn. Right. And so, a very good example of it. Well, my 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 karate ideas like step first, hit hard. Mm-hmm. Step first, hit hard. Step first, hit hard. You know, feet first. Eyes, feet, hands. Eyes, feet, hands. Eyes, feet, hands. Look, step. Then you then you pick them up. And and I thought I knew what that meant. You know, the rooting of stance. And I thought I knew what that meant. And I probably learned more about barehanded karate by practicing sword Mm -hmm. than all the punches I've thrown. Because there's something, the mechanics change. And not only that, I realized certain things that, you know, on the defensive side, on the self-defense side, things start to make a lot more sense when you take into account that you are barehanded standing across from somebody with two and a half feet of razor sharp steel. Yeah. Right. Things start to make sense. So, and not in a baby son way, not in a superficial way. And this only happens later on. And as you continue to drill and as you think, you know, something and then you have a new illumination to it and you get it, you gain a deeper understanding of it. Right. So what do I mean by that? All right. So everybody's familiar with the idea. And Bruce Lee made it famous, even though it was an old koan about, you know, the the teacup. Yeah. And the the student coming to the instructor with a teacup that's already full. But what's really funny, and they leave this out, most people leave this out is, well, what are you supposed to do with the tea that's already in your cup? What do you do with it? You throw it out? Flush it on the floor. I'm asking you, what do you do with the tea that's in the cup? You drink it. You drink it. That's right. You have to assimilate what's in the cup, make room in the cup so that you can get more tea to assimilate. Right? So, yeah. and so these are the kind of things that you hear, uh, you know, uh, armchair uh, Asian philosophizing, you know, the empty your cup and the drink your tea and the, the this and that. And the, um, but when you, when you, the concept of learning, memorizing, and then forgetting the technique that's going to magically, deliciously appear when you need it most, mm. right? Again, these are oversimplifications. And so what happens is it becomes very difficult to express something that is flirting with being non-expressible, right? 
So how do you how do you express to a child the idea of assimilating something, whether it's an idea, whether it's an action? You know, one of one of my sticking points, Joe Rogan. I love his podcast, but I don't watch any of his martial arts podcasts because there's a lot that he puts forward that I I don't necessarily agree to, and I, right. I don't have to listen to it. Uh, and I think he's a smart guy. He's an interesting guy. I would love to go drinking with him. Yeah, I can hang out. I can hang out with Joe Rogan, uh, but and maybe I would like to do this as well as to get into the into some of the debate with the more traditional practices that we have in the more traditional arts. Now, Joe mm-hmm. Joe Rogan has a very storied, very powerful basis in Taekwondo. Yeah, the fucker was formidable his own right you know not just a comedian telling jokes and then became you know dana white's guy no i fought and can't fight and can't handle himself uh and that's you know he's no he's no punk there no but you can watch him choke out someone on uh fear factor easy yeah 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 so you know but like the idea that there's no there's no what 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 good is the rising block and that's you know that's that's a sore point me right that's a sore point for me because everything has its value if it if it's being done in earnestness I'm a, now there are outriggers to this there are outliers you have your charlatans no doubt about it but the the idea of of this action is something that's innate in the whole human being and primates in general yeah you know you go to a small child raise your hand like you're gonna crack them across the top of the cocoa and they're gonna put their hands up their head's gonna tuck down there's a reason why we do that. Yeah. And to think that the way rising block is used is the way that it's taught, shame on you because it's much deeper than that. So when I teach it, yeah, I teach it wrist to wrist because I want to make sure everybody goes home with their teeth so they can eat corn on a cob. Right. Right. But when you take it in terms of, hey, somebody's coming at me with a two and a half foot piece of razor sharp steel or a goddamn baseball bat raised over their head, and I bring this sucker up and under their armpit and knock them out of their shoes with it. There's a reason. Right? So, you know, when we're talking about kata and, and, and its efficacy and why we do that, that's another big argument, the idea of kata. Every sport has its kata. You play basketball, you do drills, that's kata. So, the way the way I think of it and the way I I express it is kata forms are are the are the catalogs of your technique. Mm-hmm. Because then the only other way you could practice your technique if you didn't have that catalog was to be in constant physical conflict. And then how do you train for the death dealing blows without killing people if you're constantly in physical conflict in order to keep your technique sharp? Boxers. Don't just hit on other human beings as part of their training. Right. They beat the shit out of bags, speed bags, heavy bags, light bags, midweight bags, speed balls. Right? Right. So these are the equivalents. These are the equivalents. So, you know, that that's, you know, where I kind of diverge, you know, but, you know, he's selling that marketing tool and, and that's fine. Yeah, there's no judgment for that, but don't don't tell me that what I what I do is useless, you know. Right. And yeah, and you may be the bigger dog. There may be a, a bigger fight in you as a dog, but you never know. Maybe I'm the windshield today, and, I, and you're the bug, and you get choked out, or you get your teeth knocked. So you don't know. You don't right. know. Right. So know. overall, what it seems like is most rewarding is kind of getting that rejuvenation, getting, you know, Absolutely. new people interested in it. Um, and I think that's, that's watching a very, somebody do something, watch some, watching somebody do something and be successful at something that they never imagined for themselves. Right. That's rewarding. I mean, that is so empowering for everybody who is a part of it. Yeah. The individual, you as the one that helped them get there, you know, if the child, the parent that brought them, exposed them to it, mm-hmm. every that's everybody wins on that one. Everybody wins. So I wanted to kind of end things with where are you 
now like where if people are in the new jersey area they they're interested and they're very you know, the big state <laughs> mm -hmm. so, if they're in maplewood uh, yeah so i recently embarked i'm embarking on um on a uh on a venture yeah uh, in point pleasant new jersey borough not beach because they're very specific about that <laughs> right uh so uh again those who know me know and who are friends with me on facebook uh most recently received an invite from me to like a, uh, a page called bushiyama karate uh this is my attempt to bring my particular brand uh bring my karate to the world you know and so again located in uh, point pleasant look for bushiyama karate on facebook uh the address is there uh, it's a very interesting business model in that um, uh, I actually am sharing space with a Taekwondo school, which is unheard of. Yeah. Uh, between, you know, there's always been this this rivalry between Taekwondo and karate. And for the life of me, I never could understand it. Uh, and if anything, I think that, um, you know, each has a little something that they can benefit from from the other. Uh you know, the kicks of, of Taekwondo with the hands, the hands of traditional karate, that's formidable. Absolutely formidable, can be. So, uh, but you know, my program is, is, a, is a, little, a little more far reaching than just kicks and punches. Mm -hmm. uh, I certainly am interested in uh, expressing and exposing students to the more completeness of the art with the takedowns, with the throws, with the chokes, with the strangles. Um, uh, anybody who's ever spent time with me on the deck and trained with me, know I'm big on parries. I love mm. the parries. Yeah. Uh, Cause they set up for the chokes, you know? And so, and for the takedowns and for the, the pull downs, the throw downs. Um, and, you know, and I, and I hope to be successful with this. And, and, and I do have strong uh, ties in the, in the martial arts community. And I can very easily uh, see bringing in, uh, you know, high level instructors mm -hmm. of very different martial arts uh, onto the deck. And it's just to be able to offer that to, to my student body. And then along with the empty hand karate and the traditional karate weapons that come out of that, uh, I have the sword that, I, that I'd like to work with as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we'll take it from there. We'll take it from there. That sounds great. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time. It becomes great. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be. I think we've already well, talked about it. It's it's yeah. in the cards. It's going to happen. It's just I a think, matter of I when. Think, yeah, yeah. I think, I think and you know, and I think we're getting to a point uh, with the whole COVID thing that, uh, you know, we spoke about this earlier on our first go around. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think we're getting to the point between the various vaccines, uh, I think as the political scene becomes a little more stable for everybody, everybody starts to feel a little more comfortable around each other again, uh, that the dam is going to break, man. And people are hungry now. They're already a little stir crazy and they're hungry now for shit to do. And there's plenty to do. And I think that on the back end of this, you're going to see this uptick, uh, this resurgence of all things outdoors, mm. all things outdoors. And rightly so, we're not meant we're not meant to be confined, right? As a species, and so um, I, I'm hoping that 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 indeed is the case. Uh, I'm I'm hoping that that happens sooner rather than later. But even now, I see you know the harbors are there, uh, things are loosening up. Mm -hmm. uh, even the school districts down this way are doing pod classes, or they're doing a uh, uh, what, what the hell do they call it? Um, hybrid classes yeah like an in-person in -person and online and splitting that up and yeah you know and 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 then springs around the corner too and one thing about this part of new jersey especially the jersey shore is there's a lot of a lot of underutilized parkland yeah baseball fields some are manicured some are wild or whatever you know but you got a meadow you got a field you got space you got space and and I'm pretty good at projecting my voice. So, you know, there's no reason not to, 
I, I, I was watching people train, train in the parking lots, you know, from the local uh, Max Challenges and Planet Fitness and stuff like that, which is what yeah. you do. She's smart. You know, who wants to breathe, air, you know, <laughs> recirculated air? Oh, get some fresh air. Get some vitamin D from the sun. Yeah. yeah. That's how we're managed. So, you know, I'm hoping that, uh, like I said, that uh, that the timing is a little bit better. Um, I had alluded to this earlier. Out of the free classes I was teaching uh, last year, I was uh, getting getting a lot of positive feedback. Mm. A lot of kind of pressure, you know, you have a studio or when are you going to open your studio? Where's your studio? Where's your school? Where's your school? When are you going to open the school? And so to the point where I, I had I had planned originally to open for this year, to try to open something for this year. And uh, so much so, so much feedback that I felt the pressure last year to open up. Right. And to, to the point where I was looking at spaces and I was looking to make a commitment and then COVID broke out. And Tucker Factor Zero, right? Everybody, yeah. everybody sucked up. We didn't know what the hell we were looking at. And um, so in that regard, I'm glad I didn't jump off then because I would have lost my shirt. You know, I would have been yeah. one of these stories that you hear about. Uh, this endeavor I'm in now, like I said, I'm sharing a space with a Taekwondo school. So it effectively allowed me to come forward without worrying about the capital cost of outfitting Outfitting space. Yeah. It's just a matter of kicking in on the nut. <clears throat> so uh, I have a tentative date of the, oh, where's my phone? I'm going to be doing an open house, an open house for the uh, Saturday the 20th of this month, which is a couple of weeks out. There's a couple the of 13th, weeks out. I'm sorry. 13th, that's even sooner. Which is actually almost <laughs> a week or two away. That's 10 days away. Yeah, which is fine which is fine i'm prepared for that um but yeah for so for the next the next uh couple of weeks i'm going to try to recruit as much as i can uh and that's going to be my life that's going to be my life is going to be really recruiting just trying to get the bodies in trying to get the bodies in, trying to get the bodies in yeah. trying to build up that uh that student that student body um and and make it happen mm -hmm. make it happen and i hope to like i said i hope to get some of the adults i hope to get some of the older people I hope to get some of the older guys who probably are a little too sedentary right now. Yeah. We could probably benefit from a little movement in a place they feel comfortable. And in a way, and with someone they feel Right. So that's where I'm at, So, Well, I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to literally sit down and talk to me and break all this down. I really hope to do this soon. I think I've already started spitballing ideas for you because uh, yeah. I've expressed my own interest in kind of getting back into the saddle. Yeah, well, we have a lot of conversation to have. Ooh, we have a lot of things coming up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, thank thank you for inviting me to do this. Of course, uh, I, I had been, you know. It was funny because when you mentioned it, I was like, you're like, would you mind? Mind, man, I've been waiting for you to ask me. I've been waiting to do something with you. So, uh, so this was very cool. I, I want to thank you for that. No, I, I appreciate it. So check out Bushiyama Karate on Facebook. If yep. you're in the Point Pleasant area, not beach, check them out. Well, beach too, but they beach just, too? Hey. It's snooty, yeah. <laughs> so, They're not snooty. Uh, just, they, they, they do their own thing. They differ. I guess it's a book, like a Brooklyn Queens thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well. Thank you guys so much for listening. Really appreciate it. And we will talk soon. We'll do this again real right. soon. Real soon. Real soon. Your soul is mine, DK. Real soon. <laughs> <laughs>